I'm Josh Tekel. I'm one of the directors of the Kiss the Ground movie. I'm Rebecca Tekel. I'm also one of the directors of the Kiss the Ground movie. <laughs> There's so much bad news about our planet, it's so overwhelming. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet, and it's as old as dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soils, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues if we bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant, healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. That is the trailer for the Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground. And this is Factual America. Factual America is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for an international audience. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and every week we look at America through the lens of documentary filmmaking by interviewing filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, to find out where you can see our films, and to connect with our team. On a daily basis, we are inundated with more bad news about the environmental catastrophe unfolding in front of our very eyes. But is it too late? Can anything really be done? It's enough to make us give up. Many of us have. But a simple solution may be literally underneath our feet, according to the Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground, from award-winning filmmakers Josh and Rebecca Trickell. Kiss the Ground reveals that by regenerating the world's soils, we can completely and rapidly stabilize Earth's climate, restore lost ecosystems, and create abundant food supplies. Is it really that simple? We found out when we caught up recently with Josh and Rebecca from their home in California. Josh and Rebecca Tekel, welcome to Factual America. Josh and Rebecca, how are things with you? Well, you know, considering uh, there's a global pandemic and we're <laughs> releasing a movie in the middle of it, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, one of our guests said COVID good, I think. COVID, COVID good. good. I, <laughs> <laughs> That's starting, and I'm starting to use it now. I, I think we, anyway, we're all in this same same boat together. Uh, the great equalizer, hopefully. Um, so award award winning uh, co directors and co producers, a wealth of great, uh, incredible credits you have. But what we're here to discuss, and as you've uh, listeners have already heard and heard the trailer, is kiss the ground. Uh, which Natalie, uh, Natalia Winkleman of the New York Times described as a persuasive and optimistic plan to counter the climate crisis. 
narrated by Woody Harrelson. It's uh, available on Netflix or rent for a dollar on Vimeo. What can you get for a dollar these days? You can get a, an incredible documentary. So, uh, so well done. So thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Um, so uh, I guess you should start by saying congratulations. Um, Netflix audiences love it. Uh, I see your trailers over 7 million downloads. I think you're aiming for a hundred though, but uh, how do you feel? I mean, not the uh, the pandemic notwithstanding. I think we're overall <laughs> totally overwhelmed with the response to the movie. It's exciting to see people picking up, you know, this is a story ultimately of hope and empowerment around an issue that we've all felt very disempowered around. So to see audiences and viewers responding to that in a positive way during what could be categorized as kind of a dark time uh, I think it's it's a real testament to human, you know, spirit and and to the desire to to have a better world. I think we'll we'll quickly touch on that uh, optimism and um, and other elements of of this film uh, shortly. But maybe for our listeners out there who haven't had a chance to see it, um, uh, maybe you could give us a synopsis of the film. Sure. Kiss the Ground is a film about how we can reverse climate change through drawdown, which is bio sequestration, taking all that extra carbon that we've put up into the atmosphere and drawing it down into healthy soil. And this is a breakthrough because we are all sort of at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, around climate change and desertification. And the fact that there is a place for all of this carbon to go and it's right under our feet and it's so simple is such a breakthrough. And the, the amazing thing is that the answer has been here all along. Okay. That's, that's a very, uh, well, it's a perfect synopsis as someone who's seen the film and, and uh, found it very uplifting and, and encouraging. But just want to uh, get to, you know, you, you have an innovative start to this uh, for a climate change doc. Um, I think we've already heard it in the trailer. We've got Woody Harrelson. I basically starts off saying, I've given up and I bet you have too essentially, if I paraphrase. Um, do you think most people have given up? Human beings tend to be local optimists. We tend to be very optimistic about our family, our home, where we live. But when it comes to the macro, we tend to be very pessimistic. And that has to do with the wiring of our brain. We're just generally not wired to think in terms of global level ideas and problems. So climate change, big problem, very, very negative idea. Most of us are in a state of paralysis, shock, nihilism, somewhere between, you know, I've given up, I don't care, and I'm going to stick my head in the sand. And that is, an, and then we feel guilty about it. And then we, you know, or denial. Or denial. <laughs> and then people in the climate movement make other people feel guilty for feeling that way. Mm -hmm. that, none of that is, 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 should, nobody should feel guilty about it. This is a natural response okay. to an overwhelmingly large problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you begin to pull apart the problem and say, well, what really is the problem? To Rebecca's point earlier, the problem is very simple. We have put the carbon in the wrong place. Mm. It needs to go somewhere else. And when you break it down into super simple terms like that, it suddenly becomes very manageable. It's a management problem. This is a, mm. this is a, same problem that you have in your house. When your house is a mess, you've put the mess in the wrong spot. And so we've made a little mess. Well, it's a big one, but the essential mechanism is the same for cleaning it up. Okay. I mean, I think for me, um, watching this and having um, dealt or danced around the subject really in some ways uh, on many of our podcasts, it feels like this is a bit of the... Uh, for me, at least personally, this is sort of the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, I mean, to, to your point about um, s scaring ourselves into inaction, I guess. I mean, we've, we've addressed, we looked at, um, I'm not trying to name names, but we've looked at Inconvenient Truth and how that is sort of pitched. And then more, more recently, we've looked at um, two uh, docs that dealt with uh, factory farming, more one on the eating animals, one dealing with uh, the the livestock side of things and what soilism dealing with the ag side. Um, we've recently had the uh, Richard, uh, the David Attenborough um, uh, people on uh, documentary about life on our planet. But 
I feel like, and that's talking about biodiversity, uh, this feels like this is the first one I've really seen that focused on um, focused on the soil. Uh, and is, is, is that how, I mean, that, that really is what this is all about. I mean, it's kiss the ground. I mean, this is the, the, the answer there, as you said earlier, is underneath our feet. Yeah, this is, this is an elegant solution to a seemingly intractable problem. And the solution is very simple. Soil, when it's healthy, is 50% carbon by weight. Plants, when they're healthy, pump 40% of the carbon dioxide that they breathe down through their roots into the ground as carbon. Mm -hmm. And the microbes, which are really the conveyors and the movers and the shakers of the underworld, those little critters, their job is to convey carbon to deeper and deeper levels. So if we manage that ecosystem for health and for well-being, the ecosystem will actually do most of the work that we need to do in order to balance our climate. It's not us creating some new technological invention or some new scientific idea. This is us helping nature, working with nature, still producing food, still producing fiber, still producing feed, all those things that we need, in fact, producing way more than we are today. But in so doing, from a healthy ecosystem perspective, storing tremendous amounts of carbon, you know, gigaton level amounts of carbon that can balance the atmosphere within 20 to 30 years. There's no other proposition on the table that can do that. So, hey, make farmers more money, make more food, balance the climate, help the water cycle. Uh, yeah, this is a new idea, but it's a, an extremely powerful idea. I mean, it sounds like a, a no-brainer, and I think we'll get into some more details of these solutions in a, in a few minutes. But maybe it's worth uh, also talking about how we got here. I mean, I know everyone very well aware of all the, uh, the, uh, the carbon we've been burning and, and fossil fuels and things like that. But uh, I think what was interesting about uh, an interesting element of your, of your doc is um, what we've done to the soil as, as well. So uh, maybe you can give us a little sort of, I mean, my, my feel is we've created a sort of global version of the Dust Bowl or are in the process of doing that. So um, maybe you can give us a little look back in terms of how we've gotten to where we are now. You want me to do it? You want to do it? You go ahead. Okay. Um, basically, <laughs> we've, we've, this is all we talk about. I mean, we really, yeah. this, is, this is our life. So it's like, how far into this do you want to go? Um, but I think really, um, since settlers have come to America, we have been just stripping um, the topsoil and we've lost two thirds of the earth's topsoil. And that's from what we've been doing here in the United States for the last hundred years, tilling and spraying chemicals. And um, we, it only took us a little bit of time to destroy that incredible, rich, healthy life in the ground um, that, that was here. Um, that was sort of managed and lived in conjunction with by Native American people, indigenous people for so long. And then we came and we just ripped up all of that topsoil. And that's kind of what we've been doing as a species around the world is going in and like really extracting from the environment without really thinking seven generations into the future. And so that's what we've done here. And back when the Dust Bowl happened, after we ripped up all of that beautiful topsoil, and then suddenly it just it turned into dust and the farmers went bust and the you know, the air was just filled with all of this dirt desertification. And that's what we're seeing still happening today. Um, there was a plan, the NRCS was created to help farmers learn how to live in harmony with the land, make sure the land um, was always covered to reduce the tilling. Um, but then after World War II, all of these chemicals were, had been used in World War II and had been used to kill people. But they had this incredible machine um, that they wanted to keep running after the war ended. And so instead of fighting people, we started fighting the pests in the field on the food that we eat. And without really thinking about what the consequences of that might be long term in terms of our overall health. And the result has been decades of chemical use and degraded soil and years of dust bowl that is expanding around the world, unfortunately. But the good news is that through regeneration, we can reverse that degeneration, that desertification. And that's ultimately what these regenerative agricultural practices are all about. And you know, I'm actually a sixth generation farmer. My dad um, 
is in the Midwest in the U.S. in Ohio, soy and cor soy and corn. Um, and so, and we have a little regenerative farm here where we actually made Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground is actually made in an avocado barn <laughs> um, that we've converted into a movie studio that and we're hmm. regenerating our soil here. And our two children that were born during the last seven years that we've been making this film, their whole life has been about regeneration and they're self-proclaimed farmers as, as well. So they're kind of like the seventh generation farmer in my family. And um, I think the idea is that um, no matter what side of the spectrum you're on, whether you're a farmer in the Midwest or, you know, you're a regenerative farmer in California, like we, we, we're so at odds right now, but regeneration is something that is so unifying for everyone, no matter where they may fall in the political spectrum or just in terms of their philosophical views. It's really, this is a global issue that we have been dealing with since the dawn of time. Okay. And it's really a shift right here. It's a shift okay. in our heads. It's a, it's a mental shift that we have to make to really make this work. I mean, I think, uh, go well, ahead. I, was, I just want to add one, one point to what Rebecca said. You know, when we talk about civilizations and we look at the macro scale, you know, the United States being an example um, of a modern piece of the civilization. You know, Alan Toynbee wrote this incredible treat treatise called Civilization. And mm -hmm. in it, he details the rise and fall of 20 some odd civilizations over the course of human history. And really, if you look at that from an ecological perspective, what each of those civilizations did is they outstripped their resource base. They degraded the soil, they moved farming operations further and further from the city center, and eventually the lines between food and population became so tenuous, and the environment that sustained that population became so degraded that the environment could no longer sustain the population. And when we pull back and look at planet Earth, we've degraded two-thirds of the planet. Two-thirds of the planet we've turned into desert or semi-desert. So what we've done is we've done this experiment 20 some odd times. It's failed every single time, bar none. And now we've attempted the experiment on a global scale. The big difference is for the first time in human history, we have the macro ability to pull back with satellite technology, NOAA, NASA, all these international agencies, data crunching, big numbers. And we have the, a moment sort of hanging in space to say, whoa, We've done it again. This time we did it really big and we can keep going or we can reverse it. And we finally have the biological necessary understanding of how to reverse it and feed 10 billion people. So we're at this critical moment in human history where we could continue the experiment. We know the outcome. It's going to end the exact same way that 20 some odd other experiments in civilization mm -hmm. building ended. Or we could do a new experiment which is called global regeneration, regenerate the soil, store the carbon, and rebuild an ecosystem that can sustain 10 billion people. That's what the Kiss the Ground movie really is about. Okay, I think that's, uh, you touch on a, a lot of things that uh, I certainly was uh, hoping to raise, so, th so thanks for that. I mean, I think, uh, as you said, re regeneration, so broadly the solution, or one of the solutions is regenerative farming. Um, uh, is what are the? I mean, uh, maybe you can give us some ideas of maybe some more specifics uh, of of sort of um, what we're talking about when we talk about these sort of uh, solutions. Definitely. Let let's 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 define regeneration, and then we can talk about the farming methods. You know. Okay. Regeneration is basically the operating system of nature. It is is the operating system upon which ecology is functioning. Very simple. You pull a leaf off a tree, the tree regenerates the leaf. It grows a new leaf. When a lizard loses a tail, it grows a new tail. And what we have not heretofore known as human beings is that the macro of an ecosystem works the same as a micro. So you desertify a forest, the forest can come back. And what is inherent in that ecosystem is the same memory that's in the tree, the same memory that's in the lizard. It's called ecosystem memory. The microbes remember how to rebuild soil. The seeds remember how to go into the ground. Things remember how to grow. So what we're seeing is regeneration as a concept is now firmly, firmly accepted 
as a macro, mm. as a macro ecological concept. Therefore, regenerative farming or agriculture or ranching is a way of producing food in which you're constantly regenerating the soil. You're building the topsoil. You're building those layers of soil that may have taken hundreds or even thousands of years to build. We're rebuilding them in three to five years using intensive ecological organic man management. And we can talk about the specifics of what that looks like. Do you wanna go into the farming specifics? Yeah, basically it's um, you stop tilling, you stop spraying all of the chemicals, you let the land start to heal. And essentially you want to grow things that mimic what it was before we came in and disturbed it. So if it was an oak tree savanna, that's now just orange groves, for instance, you would want to bring back the oak and you would want to try to mimic mm -hmm. how nature developed that region and then build into that a managed system of biodiversity and food that we can live along inside of. And so, and, and it's really a, a forward thinking model, but really what you're trying to do is jumpstart the small water cycle. And when, once you jumpstart that small water, water cycle and you're drawing and attracting rain and you're storing it in the soil, and as you begin to build the soil through animal integration, through keeping the ground covered at all times, through keeping those animals moving like they were being moved by a predator as they naturally would be in nature, by having a built-in insurance policy, which is biodiversity, not just having a monocrop that then is susceptible to drought, blight, everything. You know, in order to have a healthy immune system, we have to really build in biodiversity that no subsidy system could ever provide. And not only are you building in an insurance system policy immunity for that crop, but you're building that in for the entire environment, for the ecosystem, for the people who are out there working on the land, for the people that live in that environment and that community. And, ov and overall, what you're really doing is you're jump-starting rain. And then you're, you're jump-starting that small water cycle that continues to grow. And so when Josh says, you know, global cooling potentially by 2050, which is what we're talking about, you know, that's what we're looking at is how can we attract the rain? How can we have healthy, spongy soil that mimics what it once was before we came in, stripped it of life, and planted a single thing that we thought would be the most profitable? So, and, and the irony is when we stop spraying chemicals that we think are being used to feed the world, really what you're doing is creating the opposite effect. It's kind of a backwards thinking. Um, you know, yeah, you may get rid of the chemical for a minute, but you're going to have to pay more for more inputs. Um, ultimately, you're going to have lower profit margins over the years, lower output, um, and the soil is just going to degrade and blow away. So it's going to get more and more expensive, and it's already a broken system. So literally what's being discovered is that, like Josh said, in three to five years, using these basic principles of regeneration, that land can, can increase the soil organic matter, that life in the soil that can store water and most importantly for all of us, store carbon. Okay. Can I just say, I don't know if I've had two filmmakers who know their subject as well as you, as you do. I think you've definitely been living and breathing this for, for your, most of your lives. Um, I, I want to raise, I, I had it later in my notes, but I think uh, you raise a good point. I think what the film does so well, and I, uh, is illustrating, uh, you know, it's not just a, it, well, it, it never preaches, that's for sure, um, is that, you know, you, you offer solutions and you offer palatable solutions. I think on the farming front, you're just talking about, um, and is it uh, Gabe Brown, the, um, the rancher up in North Dakota, who's, uh, you know, you talk about what his, his yields are and his profits, and you talk about how much fertilizers needed now to grow a bushel of wheat versus what it was in 1960. I mean, we're just basically zapped all the nutrients out of the ground and you're just having to use more and more chemicals. We know the same thing with, uh, uh, you know, the livestock side, a number of drugs that need to be fed to these animals in order to keep them from, from croaking before they need to be, uh, um, you know, harvested basically. Um, so I think that's, I mean, that's, I think that's a very compelling element, many compelling elements to this film. But uh, um, I just, I, I think it's very interesting to see. I, I mean, basically what I'm getting to is that this seems like a sector, specifically if you're talking about uh, agriculture, that's just ripe for disruption, isn't it? I mean, if, if it's, it's, it's just a lot of people who are just have been so tied into doing what uh, farming a certain way that it's just that tough 
you know, you almost need that sort of uh, bridge to get from one way of doing things to the other. Uh, would you, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, look, w whenever you get to a crisis point in any massive industry, there is, there is the opportunity for disruption. And we're at that moment with global agriculture. And what most people don't realize is there's a massive calorie gap that, that comes into play between now and 2050. You know, 2050, we'll, we'll have about 10 billion people on the planet, uh, according to the United Nations. And if we backtrack that to the current rate of increase of food production using all of the chemicals, all of the GMOs, all of the high tech, mm ag tech, camp, you know, satellite positioning and all that wonderment. We have a widening calorie gap that leaves us with a billion people not fed in 2050. There is no political or economic system on earth that can deal with that kind of catastrophe. So unless we have a disruption, we are going to create our own disruption. And that is when an industry is ripe for change. Certainly the global agricultural market, you know, you're talking about a total market cap of, you know, well over a trillion dollars and, and up. And, and so any major business entity that is looking at food, which is apart from water, the most basic commodity, you know, mm -hmm. it's inelastic. The demand is infinite for this. Uh, any major entity, whether it's a government or a major corporation would be, would be stupid not to look at regenerative agriculture because the bottom line with regenerative agriculture is more profits. Why? Carbon in the soil equals fertility. If you don't have carbon in the soil, you are farming on the moon. You are sustaining plant life with chemicals and with fertilizers. You're not using the inherent superpower, the turbocharged power of microbes. And microbes live in a carbon aqueous environment. They don't live without the carbon in the water. The water doesn't go without the carbon. So carbon, carbon, carbon. We, we keep coming back to this central idea. If we want to feed the world and if we want companies to be profitable, which, you know, it's capitalism, let's face it, mm -hmm. let's, let's make companies profitable. Um, but in order to do that, we're going to have to put the carbon in the soil. So we're talking about a multi, multi, multi billion dollar opportunity, both in terms of carbon credits reaching into the trillions of dollars and in terms of feeding the world, which is why everyone in the world, including hardcore capitalists that want to make a lot of money from food, should go to Netflix and watch the Kiss the Ground movie or go to <laughs> kissthegroundmovie.com and watch it for a dollar yeah. because this is the next global industry. Okay. And where are the politicians in all this? They, I mean, you have one in your they're, film. They're but, catching uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have a, have a lovely Frenchman, a French uh, agricultural okay. minister, a former minister, but that seems to be it. Uh, um, are they that, they're that far behind? Here's that, the thing. We have to be louder than the lobbyists. That's all there is to it. I mean, there hmm. really is an information gap. There has been an information gap. It's not that these techniques and these practices haven't been around. But for the most part, people don't know about it. Most people don't know what regeneration, regenerative agriculture is, or that it's a pathway to drawing down carbon. It's kind of, you know, even though it's been around, it's a new concept for most people. And so politicians are really going to speak to what they think their constituents want. And if their constituents don't know about biosequestration, then that's not going to be what they're pulling for. But certainly the chemical companies are pulling for something. So I think you know, it's, it's an information gap. And once we as the people begin to understand how this system really works and we get informed and educated around this issue, we can really start to see these changes put into place because you know, we live in, an, in a world where when we all agree to something, we can make it happen as evidenced this year by COVID. So if we all agree mm. that what we need to do right. is regenerate the planet and reverse climate change, then clearly we can do it. It's just a matter of being, you know, louder than the people who are in it for other reasons like profits. Yeah. And, and I think there are signs of uh, po policy hope. Uh, and I separate policy from politics. Okay. Because yeah. this is a very apolitical movie. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a movie that, that does, if you watch it, inspire reasonable and smart policy. I, you know, we saw 
Biden mentioned carbon sequestration through soil in one of his um, one of his statements. We, uh, Senator uh, Cory Booker has put forth a piece of legislation that outlaws a confined animal feed operations. That's mm -hmm. a really that's a key element to making this new system work is getting rid of those confined animal feed operations. And we see in France, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Stefan Le Foll with the four for 1000 program, the former minister of agriculture for France, you know, he's really operating inside a, an entire system in France, which encourages something called bioregionalism. Mm -hmm. Bioregionalism means protecting the biology of each region, including what's grown there. So that's a great way of incentivizing farmers and ranchers to make products that are really specifically from their region, cheeses, meats, wines, but also produce, vegetables, fruits, the things where we know we're supposed to eat as human beings to be healthy. So, you know, there are multiple policy mechanisms for making this happen. And I, I think there is super, super big encouragement to be had from, from seeing, you know, the first little steps that are being taken around the world. Okay. Well, I think that might bring us to a good point for a little break for our listeners. And um, we'll be back shortly with uh, Josh and Rebecca to continue talking about Kiss the Ground. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Josh and Rebecca Trickell, the co-directors and co-producers of Kiss the Ground, which can be seen on Netflix or the uh, Kiss the Ground uh, website, if you would uh, rather look at it that way. Um, LA Times described it as it's a dense but it's dense but nutritious. The science is explained in simple terms with plenty of visually striking graphics and animation. Uh, Josh and Rebecca, we've been talking a lot about agriculture, regenerative farming. You know, the one thing that su surprised me, and having seen a lot of these films, um, cows are not the problem. At least that some of us have been maybe led to believe. Uh, I mean, at least. They, they are a problem in one way, uh, but they can actually be part of the solution. Can you, can you explain? The only way to bring this desert back to life is through animal integration. So if you want to take a place that's completely denuded of water, completely denuded of any microorganisms, you need to bring, start to bring in that life. And um, ruminants are the way that you can begin to do that. And um, that's the only way that we can really do that on the kind of large scale that we need to do. There are other ways too, like compost, covering the ground, um, you know, cover crops, that kind of thing. But really you need cows at this point because we've wiped out the buffalo that yeah. roamed. Yeah. Um, and so there's a way to bring back together the systems that we've separated. So we've taken all of our livestock and we've moved them over into these small confined animal feed operations. And then we've taken all of our food and we've moved it over into these other monocrop industrial systems that really have their roots in slavery, if you think about it, um, where one person really gets the most benefit and the, the people out front aren't. But in other systems, it's really just mostly mechanical and there's really not a lot of interaction with the land itself. And so, um, yeah, uh, we have to start to bring animals out onto the land the way that they would have before we came in and moved everything around. And um, cows are one of the best ways to do that. But, it, but again, it's different for different regions, depending on what was there before. Um, you want mm. it to really, you don't want to just stick cows in a place where that's not the best place. There are lots of other ruminants that can do a great job as well. And also, you know, managing different types of, of species. You don't just want to have one type of um, you know, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. So that's how we are able to bring this dirt back to healthy, living, rich soil is through the stomping of the hooves and through the urine and through the fertilization that they bring. Um, it's, it's miraculous what animals can do when they're back out on the land and moving. Yeah. And I, and I think your film does it, does it extremely well in, in showing that and showing the, how areas have bounced back from, uh, from these, new old 
farming methods. Um, I forgot I, to mention though the most important thing, which is the difference between when you have cows in a confined animal feed operation versus when they're out roaming in nature. So when they're in a confined animal feed operation, a CAFO, you're going to see a net greenhouse gas emissions, or you're going to see more emissions coming out of that CAFO than if you have a cow out in the pasture. But the thing that people don't know is not only are you going to see less, you're actually going to see a net drawdown of greenhouse gases when you have cows mm -hmm. out in pasture. So it's the opposite scenario that we have when we have separated our cows from our food. When they're combined and working together in harmony with one another, overall, what you're going to see is drawdown. And to, to that point, to Rebecca's point, it's important to understand that, you know, according to archaeologists and, and really the, the big studies that have been done on total number of ruminants, there are far more ruminants on Earth pre-Industrial Revolution than post-Industrial Revolution. So this idea, like, we've got to get rid of the cows, the cows are the problem, like, there were way, way, way more multi-stomached creatures roaming in herds prior to us inventing the way that animals should be treated. Uh, and what we do know is the biogenic cycle, the cycle of moving carbon and methane around the planet, managed itself quite well until we humans decided that we would put these cows in, in feedlots and chickens and so on and yeah. so forth and create this abomination. So as Rebecca said, I think it's something the film points to, Kiss the Ground, the movie points to, but I think we can all agree it's time to not have animals in those conditions. Whether you eat meat or not, yeah. nobody wants that. That, that is, that is it's, it's not Didn't right. It's just not right. Yeah. 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 I, I think um, anyone, uh, and as someone who's watched some of these films that have shown some of these conditions, yes, I, I think you'd have to agree uh, on, on that one. I certainly, I certainly do. We'll talk about some of these issues some more in a, as sort of towards the end, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about the project and the filming of this, which is one thing we do look at uh, on this podcast. And um, I'm going to channel my, uh, my granddad here and basically say, how did the hell do you go about making a compelling film about dirt? I mean, what do you, how do you, and, and what you've done, you know, um, but if you told people I'm going to make a film about dirt, I don't think that's going to get, I'm sure when you were trying to go to investors or however you finance this, I'm sure they were, yes. you didn't Maybe. necessarily say, yeah, count me in, you know, um, um, I mean, uh, whose idea was this? Um, Not ours. It was a terrible idea, actually. Yeah. It's a really, <laughs> really yeah. oh, the, the expression is, it's like, it's boring as dirt. Is yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is going to be a oh, great no. movie. Whoa. Yeah. Hold this yeah. back. We had you just know? made four movies about oil. So you yeah. can imagine the next thing we wanted to make a movie about was soil, even more compelling. <laughs> <laughs> just add an S on the front. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's um, the real, the bottom line to this story is we've been in the environmental and climate movement for a long time. Uh, me for, you know, basically all of my life. 30, 35 year, of my 45 years have been working in environmental issues. Um, ever since I was a small child and grew up next to an oil refinery, it really, it really prompted me on this journey to look at solutions. And re when Rebecca and I got together, we got together inside the context of this work. We, we yeah. began making our first film, Fuel, which mm -hmm. won Sundance. Yep. It, it was shown in the White House and, and shortlisted for an Oscar. It was all about solutions to the oil problem. And we, as a community of environmentalists and climate concerned human beings, have been looking for the missing link. You know, yeah. great. Al Gore announced to the world, you know, climate change, 2006. My God, this is, this is scary stuff. Icebergs and polar bears, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And the solution that was proposed was to screw in a light bulb. I'm serious. That was the, that was the uptake. Uh, and, and I think that really disempowered an entire generation of people because the the technological fix was so minuscule compared to the scope and the scale of the problem mm -hmm. um and there's a terrible joke you know how many environmentalists does it take to screw in a a light bulb and the answer is it doesn't matter and that's <laughs> it's it's horrible but but in some sense it's true because we as a community knew 
that until there was an overarching solution, a new context, if you will, yeah. to look at the problem inside, we were going to keep spinning our wheels on more fear-based data. And there's plenty of data out there that'll just yeah. chill you to the core. I mean, this is, you know, this is serious stuff. We've managed planet Earth like we're a... a like we just came out of a drunken brawl yeah. and we're driving a car backwards as fast as it'll go down the highway. And so when our community kind of stood up and said, look, you got to do this thing about soil. And they started throwing the data at us. That was hard to walk away from mm -hmm. because when you look at the quantity of carbon dioxide, that legacy load in the atmosphere and you go, okay, how are we going to get that out? Like mm -hmm. what, what's the plan? light bulbs, solar panels, electric cars, all of those efficiency and non-fossil based alternatives have merit, but they don't suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Mm. They just prevent us from putting more up there. And our community was like, no, look at the data, look at the numbers, Josh and Rebecca, look, look, look. And finally we did. And it was like, oh man, this is going to be tough, but we have got to do this because yeah. this is the most important data that we've ever seen. It shows empirically that we can draw the carbon down into the Earth's soils. And that is big news. And also, you know, when it's not like we're saying we discovered regeneration or regenerative yeah. agriculture or anything like that. I mean, no. but it does strike us like a big revelation. And it strikes most people like a big revelation because of where we're at with carbon and the climate crisis and desertification, most importantly. So I think when you look at it through that lens, mm. suddenly these practices aren't just cool farming techniques in like yeah. cool permaculture. Yeah. Suddenly this is access for humanity to have a pathway forward. And the, you know, as far as we're concerned, what conversation is more important than that? Yeah, there's two conversations. There's the, the current conversation, which exists globally called game over. Mm. And then there's this conversation, which is we can live on this planet indefinitely. Mm. Well, it does. I think it's, um, um, I mean, I, I, there's been a report even just, I think it was even yesterday that basically uh, said that uh, I didn't realize China had had this whole program of planting trees. Mm -hmm. And they think that that has actually soaked up half the uh, uh, carbon that they've been, that they've generated over their sort of most recent uh, economic development period. I mean, it still means they're a net contributor, but right. it has, it did, you know, it did do, it has obviously done something. And when you, when I heard half, I mean, I thought that was absolutely amazing when you, when you think about it. Um, and I think you're, um, I think it feels also like we we're saying the politicians are way behind the curve. I think as, as individuals, as a society, we always, I think it feels like we're behind the curve in terms of the science also, uh, as well. And I think these are, it's interesting each, each movie of, or each, um, each, yeah, let's say movies over the last few years, it seems like, oh, you know, another little bit of, uh, a, it's not that the pennies dropped, but just feels like, oh, okay, that's a little more insight. And that's a little bit more insight. But what I do, I, I honestly mean this with this film, I felt like this is the sort of the thing that finally brought it all together in, in my mind, because um, yeah, lots of stuff, uh, horrible things about factory farming, uh, industrial agriculture, uh, what it means for the you know biodiversity and there needs to be solutions but I think the one that just it's it's maybe because it's not sexy it's not animals it's not you know we're talking dirt right I mean dirt. I know there's dirt a difference is, between dirt, dirt and soil is sexy. dirt is it's, dirty you're making it sexy <laughs> um, I mean speaking of sexy and all these things and um, you've got uh, uh, you you brought uh, Woody Harrelson on board. Now, how was that? Uh, uh, was that at the start? Did you start with your narrator, or did you? That was more late in the process. And how did you get him involved? He's been pretty patient. He did three. He recorded three narrations. For oh wait a minute! Before we even oh, talk my. about Woody, you have to talk about the veggie van because if it oh, weren't for God. the veggie van, then we wouldn't have had Woody. Um, and, and also veg, the veggie van, as far as I'm concerned, is another reason that Kiss the Ground got made. That's I true. saw Josh driving the veggie van back in 1997 on the Today Show. Um, yeah. The veggie van was powered by biodiesel that Josh made from waste, um, wasted cooking oil at fast food restaurants. And so he would go around and convert that vegetable oil into biodiesel or sometimes just run, he can 
convert his car to run on straight vegetable oil and did this huge tour promoting his book that showed people how they could do that at home. And that became sort of a sensation, a movement. Um, people hadn't been making biodiesel to the extent that they had after that until that book came along. And then Neil Young and Woody Harrelson and uh, mm-hmm. Willie Nelson, a bunch of people got their hands on from the fire to the fuel tank. And then they yeah. started converting their cars. And so Woody had this bus that he ran on biodiesel. And every time the fuel pump would break or something would be broken down by the side of the road, he would hand his phone over to his assistant to call Josh to figure out how to fix their broken down car. And so fortunately, it built some goodwill. (laughs) It paid off. Um, Yeah, it wasn't that they, they didn't break down that much, but they wanted to use hemp (laughs) Biodiesel. <laughs> that must have been Willie. Willie must have been involved with this as well. Making hemp biodiesel, you know, circa two thousand and three or two or whatever yeah. it was, it was like really tough. So yeah. they had a lot of questions, and we had to deal with a lot of craziness. But we got their bus going, and they they did a tour on hemp biodiesel from hemp seeds. But yeah. but uh, the 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 answer to the question um, is, you know, all these people are committed to the same thing. Woody is one of them. He has been committed from the start. He is still committed. Uh, bless him for being so patient and re-recording the narration over and over again. The hardest thing for making the film was not getting the wonderful artists who were in the film, you know, right. Woody and Giselle Bunchen and, and Ian Summerholder, all these wonderful, wonderful people, uh, Jason Mraz and Patricia Tom Marquette. Brady, yeah. Yeah. Tom Brady. Um, and that was not hard. The hardest part of making the movie was we had a committee of sometimes up to 200 scientists, PhDs, people from the mm. IPCC, you know, people in different fields. This was not just climatologists. This was biologists. These were soil scientists. These were very different fields that don't, they don't cross collaborate. They don't usually talk. They don't go to the same dinner parties even. Right. So we had them on one hand reviewing cuts, yeah. telling us specifically what needed to change. On the other hand, we do about um, 10 to 20 big test screenings each year with our community. So we bring in you know, what we thought were people that represented the audience that the film would go to. And a lot of these people are very sophisticated. But the answers that we got back from the audience about what wasn't working with the movie were mm. things like, I don't know what carbon is. <laughs> but that is a direct quote from, yeah. a, from, a, from a sur- an audience survey. And I remember the person who wrote it. They're a business owner and they're, they're a very sophisticated person. They wrote, I don't know what carbon is. You have to tell me in this movie. Okay. And then another person, I don't know the difference between carbon and carbon dioxide. And so on one hand, we're dealing with PhDs, a bunch of them, who are trying to rewrite the movie so that it's scientifically accurate. On the other hand, we're dealing with the a common <laughs> public who is like, we don't know the difference between carbon, carbon dioxide, and water molecules. Like, <laughs> it was, that's why, that took five and a half of the seven years of making the movie. It's amazing. Was creating a consolidated, cohesive language that the scientists would agree on and say, yep, that is accurate, that is correct. And that audiences could actually watch and be like, oh, I understand what's going on for the first time. Um, And I think, as you said, we do have an information gap. And part of our job as filmmakers is often not making the movie, but conveying really important scientific concepts that somehow the education system failed to convey, um, which without those concepts, we can't address things like climate change. Yeah, and I think uh, that brings me to a point. I, I think I want to give a shout out to whoever's behind your graphics and animation because I think that's one element that uh, it, it's very. It's what's innovative of this about this film. I think it's. I mean, not the first ones to do. You know, use animation and graphics to as part of a, a part of a doc, but the way it's done, and I think it's. Um, it just, I mean, it, it makes me want to, I'm going to sit down, have my teenagers sit down and watch it because I think it's a very good way of illustrating it. Uh, as humans, as we are already talking about how as humans, we don't deal with the macro. I, I think different, different ones of us l- learn in, in different ways. And, and I think uh, for those who are certainly visually oriented, I think it's a great way in terms of getting uh, the points across. So is that part of this process that you 
you had with the scientists on one side and the focus while well, your community or focus groups on the other? Oh, it was so, it was so, yes, it was, and it was so frustrating because, you know, we've gone, we did so many more graphics than what even ended up in the film because as we've been making this movie over the last seven years, really this movement has been coalescing. And so nobody would agree on anything in the beginning and we would put, you know, a graphic out there for a, in a draft and then suddenly you know, everyone was losing their minds because the numbers were wrong and nobody could agree on the numbers. And I remember it was like, hundreds of emails that were impossible to keep up with. And finally, we were just like, you know what? We're going to go talk to Paul Hawken, who everyone says is the, has the final word on this. We're going to drive up to San Francisco. We went to his home. We sat down with him. Josh was like, show me. He's like, show me. And so we, he, we finally pulled out of his brain, you know, this, what ended up being the Mauna Loa curve that goes up, 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 up of carbon mm -hmm. in the atmosphere, parts per million. And then suddenly it starts to come down and then you have global cooling. And so this concept of drawdown and being able to visually show that for us was extremely important to be able to convey the message. Um, and the other thing that I personally love in the film is that we give carbon, you can see it, because part of the issue around right. this is like, we're talking about carbon, like it's this invisible enemy that's gonna kill us all, you know? But we're made of carbon, you know? We're 16% carbon. And so, um, you know, showing carbon in these little bubbles going up when you do certain things. Like if you're, yep. if you're yep. tilling the soil or if you're spraying it, you'll see the carbon going up. And then if you see carbon going down, it's, um, you know, in the form of these little bubbles going into the earth and, and turning into eulomulin and humus and all these things. And so we're able to show how it works in this way and almost make it a character in the film. Um, and that was, I think, helpful for everyone to be able to see it in that way, not just to hear the words, because I, I'm a, definitely a visual learner. And for me, I'll, if one image can teach me something that I couldn't learn, you know, in a couple of days. Yeah. And I thought and so, that, I, that same, well, go ahead. Yeah. And so without the, without the graphics, I think people wouldn't be able to really hear the film and all of the mm. information contained. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and I thought that was that was sort of what I was alluding to. Is specifically the carbon that was just sort of it was it's very subtle, but it's there. You know, you're kind of it's reinforcing what you're additionally seeing and hearing. Uh, and it's not and for those who haven't seen it, it's not just a bunch of talking heads, not by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I, I think it's all very um, integrated in terms of how you how you uh, get this message across and help us who are maybe even not of a scientific background, kind of get a, kind of start getting, getting it in terms of what's happening. Um, I mean, in terms of stars, you talk about carbon being a character. Um, I think, yeah, we already talked about the, uh, the, the film stars, but I think you've, you've got some real stars in there and uh, uh, people like Ray Archuleta, the, uh, you've made a conservation agronomist, sort of a, a sexy character. You've got <laughs> Gabe Brown, the, the, uh, Regenerative rancher, the market guards who've making me think, rethink all the career choices I've made in life, and uh, and I love this Passion Murray and from Detroit Dirt. I mean, these are uh, are these are these people that you consider part of your community? How do you how do you meet these people? And uh, I think you they really I think in each in their own way sell the film and and what the message you're you're trying to get across so well. Well, they, they are part of our community now. Uh, and these are the true heroes of the soil movement. Uh, you mentioned Ray Archuleta first. You know, Ray's, Ray's a fascinating guy because, you know, his, his background as a, as a Hispanic person uh, is, uh, you know, really interesting. He's in an extremely white uh, mm. industry, farming. And, and he comes from a very different perspective, having worked in the Peace Corps in Guatemala. And so you've got these people who run counter to the norm. And we talked earlier about the disruptive power yeah. of regenerative agriculture. I think that the people that we tried to profile um, are disruptors and they speak to the power of this big disruptive idea. They're, they're you know, they're, they're different. They look a little different than the average person in their industry. Um, and they might be a different color or they might have a different perspective. But, you know, just like Passion Murray in Detroit, she's creating soil from all of these leftover scraps 
from General Motors and mm. from zoos. Uh, and so you see these examples of people who are genuinely leaders doing this, not because anybody told them to, but because it made sense. And each one of them now has millions of followers around the world because people are watching the movie and going, I want to be like passion. I want to make, I want to make compost and I want to make dirt in the city, or I want to be like Ray Archuleta. I want to teach people about soil. And that's, that's amazing to see the power of leadership just through example. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, everyone needs, needs to see the film, but I think um, even in some of those sessions Ray is uh, holding, I mean, what I found interesting is, like you said, it's a, you've got your some straight out of central casting, some of these farmers look, uh, but, uh, but, it's, uh, and, 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 but then there's an other sessions where you've got a younger guy and he's got like his laptop up and, you know, and I don't know, maybe he's gone to the late locals, the, the, that state's agri equivalent of an agricultural university or school and, um mm -hmm. You know, and even Ray says he never learned anything about soil and he's an agronomist, you know, so this is, uh, this is all very, it, it's, and, and Gabe says that, you know, you couldn't find anything about regenerative farming years ago. Now you can't open up a trade magazine without seeing something about it. And, and so, you know, these things take some time, but it seems like not to oversell it, but uh, it seems like there is, is change afoot. Soil has become sexy. Yeah, there we go. You heard it here first. Well, not here first, the film, but you know, you've heard it here second. Um, just a few more points and then we're gonna, I, I, we're coming to the end of our, our time together, uh, unfortunately, but uh, uh, what's it like working as a couple? I mean, I love my wife, but I would drive her crazy if we work <laughs> together. <laughs> well, we, we always get along and we always agree. So that makes it very easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't. <laughs> no, I'm just um, <laughs> no, I, I thought that was the appropriate thing to say for that. But um, no, the truth of the matter is that um, we are really compatible. And this is mm. what brought us together in the beginning. I had a feeling when I saw Josh um, driving that veggie band for some reason. I just had She it. had a feeling she could put up with me. I don't know. I was so <laughs> he, inspired. He had you at veggie that. band. Yeah. I was, yeah. you know, I was really, I was deeply moved by what he was up to, that he had come from, you know, the Gulf and seen family members get sick from poisoning from oil companies. And here he was like teaching people how to make their own fuel from a waste stream. I mean, like, ugh. so I think I just really respected what he was up to. Yeah. And I've always, I've been in the film business since I was eight. I, I was actually in a Christmas movie called Prancer when I was eight years old. That's yeah. kind of a Christmas classic here in the States. And we did our um, research. I did see that. <laughs> yes. And, you got a great uh, review, by the, the way. The holiday time, the holidays are coming up, guys. Yeah. So look, if, you're still getting you watch, residuals. So uh, movie, Prancer, watch, yeah, please watch, watch Prancer. Movie, exactly. Watch, it's got to be Prancer. No, Forget me. If you watch one movie, watch Prancer. <laughs> if you watch two movies, watch Prancer, and then kiss the ground. Okay. You know? um, thank you. And I think what I learned from that as a child was the power that films have to change the world. And so when I came out to Hollywood as a young adult, I really wanted to make movies that change the world. And then suddenly there was Josh with his mm -hmm. veggie band. So it was really clear to both of us that we both were deeply committed to this concept of regeneration before we even had the language for regeneration. But that's what we both wanted to do with our lives. And so it, it doesn't leave much space to us for us to argue over things that aren't as important to us. It really sort of helps us keep things in perspective, which is why we call our company the Big Picture Ranch. We really do try to stay yeah. aligned in our commitment to the big picture. And uh, what are some of your, what's your next project that you're working on? Well, funny you should ask, Matthew. We've got, uh, <laughs> we have a, a six part TV series that we're putting together with Excellent. many of the favorite characters from the Kiss the Ground movie, but we go deeper and we get to know them more. Uh, and it's updated, of course, with new information. And uh, Kiss the Ground's going to be available to every school in the world for free. So we're doing a big global wow. push with the Kiss the Ground movie, as well as a scholastic uh, addendum that will come with the film for mm -hmm. school teachers and students. That's exciting. That'll be available virtually as well as on DVD for students who are either at home or hopefully one day back in schools. Uh, and then beyond that, we've got a couple of other films that we had started a long time ago before <laughs> all this happened. And those will finally get to see the light of day, uh, hopefully in the next year. Um, mm -hmm. 
and you know, yeah, lots of good stuff coming, but, okay. but moving into education and moving into the TV series space to bring this message forward in new and exciting ways. That's uh, well, we look forward to, to seeing that uh, series. Uh, do you know yet where it's going to be uh, showing or streaming? We have hopes. <laughs> You're negotiating that. Well, it'll be it'll it'll be on a streaming it'll platform. It'll be widely available. Yes, yeah, exactly. one way or the other. We don't okay. know which. We don't know whether well, it'll we'll, be Netflix or iTunes or yeah. what. But it'll be somewhere. But mainly, it'll be in schools. And yeah, that, okay. As far as we're concerned, uh, those are the people that are most interested in this information because young people these days have rightly been deeply concerned about us adults getting our acts together around this issue and i completely mm. understand and they're like hey we don't want to go to school and see you guys figure this out well good news we can all go to school and learn a little bit about regeneration mm. and this pathway for them to have this awesome future and i think that is you know young people really have been so disenfranchised they're, they're just really deeply concerned about their future in a way that we can't understand in older generations mm. like they've grown up inside of this conversation their mm. whole life that their future is screwed and so for them when they learn that there actually is a pathway they're like i'm the compost king now and i'm 12 but like this is my life now yep. i'm going to get a compost program in my school we're not going to wait and we've seen this just in a little bit of time that the film has been out that the 11 year olds the 12 year olds the eight year olds they have I think many of them are finding their calling in this because I think they've been so mm. scared about what's, what's ahead. And this, for them, gives them, them hope. And so that's why we are absolutely committed to getting this message in front of as many young okay. people as we can. Okay. Uh, I think you raise a very good point. Um, this is uh, Couples Week at Factual America. We had the couple who did the uh, Boys State uh, on, um, this is last week of October, and we were, were recording this then now. Um, and uh, we kind of talked about this as well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm, I usually say, I think Gen Z is going to save the world. Now I don't, I know we can't wait for Gen Z because things need to happen now. And Gen Z's probably doesn't have their hands on the levers of power. Let's, let's put it that way. But, uh, I, I agree with you. My own daughter wants to, uh, I forget what she calls it, but she basically wants to redo our entire backyard of our house <laughs> because yeah, well, you yes. know to make it for, to promote biodiversity and and all these things you know uh yeah. and prom, you know get the bees and all these sort of things to come back and i don't you know i'm not being derogatory i mean I, I think it's 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 wonderful i mean it's a it's a school project of hers i mean i, I think it's uh um they've seen the f previous few generations really uh, f things up basically and i think they really know that something needs to be done and they're not going to sit around and wait for it to happen. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think we should underestimate the power, you know, yeah, they may not have the, their hands on the levers of traditional power, but they certainly mm -hmm. have their hands on the levers of social power. And I don't think we should underestimate the, the upcoming generation's ability to use TikTok and Instagram uh, as massive global change mm -hmm. powerhouses to get these ideas out. In fact, we're counting on them to do it. Yeah. So, you know, let's, and Weibo, if you're in China, this is, this is really the, the next stage of the work is, you know, in the United States, we need a million new farmers within the next 10 years. Mm. So a million farmers will leave the land in 10 years. That's, our, that's the entire farming population of the United States. That demographic shift is happening globally. And so, we have a global un unemployment problem at the same time that we're going to need a tremendous number of young people to go out with new ideas, new passion, and new commitment. Let's face it, it's not easy, but uh, it is really gratifying. And that, that is going to happen. And I believe they're going to use social media as a way to organize and to make this global shift happen. And that... I think that raises a very good point and something that Rebecca talked about earlier uh, that would touch me as uh, you being uh, having seventh generation farmers there in your house. Um, you know, I think as a society, all of us, my, my parents grew up on farms, but uh, uh, we've been so separated from where our food comes from. And I think there's an element of this as well. We've kind of just, maybe I'm of a generation that just, kind of grew up thinking it all comes from a supermarket. You know, you just go to the grocery store and your food magically appears. And I think this sort of reconnected, there's, there's something even almost physical, physical or visceral or something there that you, that 
you know, we're, we're an, you know, given humanity needs is, you know, it's been artificial to be separated from the land as we have had, have been the last few generations. It's so much joy to get in, to put your hands in that dirt and to smell that dirt, to literally mm. kiss the ground. We actually had a email come in from someone who said, I'm a truck driver in Texas and I watched your movie at 2 a.m. and I got out of the car and I got down on my knees and I kissed the ground and I really kissed it and I smell He goes, and I got up and he goes, I realized I needed to kiss it again. And he got down and he kissed the ground again. And he goes, and, I, and I'm a oil truck driver. He mm. works for oil companies. And yeah. so this is now, you know, this isn't the person that we thought we were going to reach. I mean, I guess we really wanted to reach everyone, but we weren't yeah. really thinking about this truck driver, you know, 3 a.m. kneeling down and kissing the ground. And I mean, even us for seven years in this conversation around our generation, it wasn't until COVID that, and it's been so hard on everyone, everyone, you know, no one, like you said, it's the great unifier, but with our children, we finally made a little vegetable garden with them. Yeah. And we were able to have them plant their own food. And now we're, you know, we've been eating the food out of our garden that we grew and they got to experience that process of planting the seed and watching it come to life. And then taking care of it and then you know there's just something to that and i mean if, if anyone listening takes anything away from today i really do hope that it's that you do go outside and kiss the ground and you do see that there is hope that we can do this and you know get let's get let's get dirty together <laughs> i uh, i couldn't put it any better um i want to thank you uh josh and rebecca thank you so much for your time i i know we've overrun a little bit and You've got uh, other responsibilities and children who need your attention. But uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on to Factual America. Uh, really appreciated. I uh, just want to remind you, uh, we've been talking with Josh and Rebecca Trickell, uh, co-directors and co-producers of Kiss the Ground. Uh, it's available on Netflix or to rent on Vimeo. Or if you're a, a, a student, uh, you might be seeing this in your uh, film shown in your school in the next uh, few days or weeks. Uh, and you can go to their, um, uh, go to their web website as well. So uh, thanks again. Uh, I want to give a shout out to This Is Distorted Studios in Leeds, England. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.